Welcome to the special CUBE conversation here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here talking about Kubernetes, cloud native, and all things cloud, cloud enterprise. Amir Sharif, VP of product and Morgan Sandy is with me. Amir, great to have you on theCUBE. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate it, John. Good to be here. You know, cloud native obviously is super hot right now as the edge is around the corner. You're seeing people looking at 5G, looking at Amazon's wavelength, outposts, you got Azure, you got a lot of cloud companies really pushing distributed computing. And I think one of the things that people really are getting into is, okay, how do I take the cloud and refactor my business? And then that's one business side. Then the technical side is, okay, how do I do it? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not that easy, right? So it, sound, it sounds really easy, oh, just go to move to the cloud. This is something that's been a big problem. So I know you guys are in the center of all this uh, and you got you know, microservices, Kubernetes at the core of this. Um, take a minute to introduce the company, what you guys do, then I want to get into some specific questions. Of course, well, Upsani is a startup, Silicon Valley startup, and what we do is automate uh, system configuration. That's typically work that an engineer does and it takes, it's lengthy, and if done incorrectly, it leads to a lot of errors and cost overruns and the user experience problems. We completely automate that using an AI and ML backend so that the engineer can focus on writing code and not worry about having to tune the little pieces working together. You know, I love the, I was talking to a VC on our last um, uh, startup showcase, cloud startup showcase, and. Um, really prominent VC, and he was talking about downstack and upstack benefits. And he says, if you're going to be a downstack um, provider, you got to solve a problem. And it has to be a big problem that, that people don't want to deal with. So as you start getting into some of the systems configuration, when you have automation at the center of this as a table stakes item, problems are cropping up as new use cases are emerging. Can you talk about some of the problems that you guys see that you solve uh, for developers and companies? Of course. So there, basically, there, the problem expresses itself in a number of domains. The, the first one is that he who pays the bills is separate from he who consumes the resources. It's the engineers that consume the resources and their incentives are to deliver code rapidly and deliver code that works well, but they don't really care about paying the bills. And then the CFO office sees the bills and there's a disparity between the two. The reason that creates a problem, a business problem, is that the developers uh, will over-provision stuff uh, to make sure that everything works and uh, they don't want to get called in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, the bill comes due at the end of the month or end of the quarter and then the CFO you know, has smoke coming out of his ears because there's been cloud over overruns. Then the reaction happens to, all right, let's cut cost. And then you know, there's an edict that comes down that says, everything, uh, reduce everything by 30%. So people go across and give a haircut to everything. So what happens next, the system's out of balance. Uh, there's uh, allocation, uh, resource misallocation and uh, systems start uh, uh, suffering. So the customers become unhappy. And ironically, if you're not provisioned correctly, not ironically, but maybe understandably, customers start suffering. And that leads to a revenue problem down the line if you have too many problems unhappy. So you have to be very careful about how you cut costs and how you uh, apportion resources. So both the revenue side is happy and the costs are happy because it all comes down to product experience and what the customers consume. You know, that's something that everyone who's done cloud development knows, you know, you know whose fault is it? You know, it's this fault. But now you can actually see the services. You leave a switch open or, you know, I'm oversimplifying it, but you know, as you experiment with services, you can, the bills can just have massive, you know, overruns and then, and then you got to call the cloud companies and you got to call the engineers up and say, why did you do this? You got to get a refund or, or the bad, one bad apple could ruin it for everyone as you, as you highlighted more of the bigger companies. So I have to ask you, I mean, everyone lives this. How do companies have cost overruns? Is there patterns that you see that you guys wrote software for to want to automate the obvious ones? Is there, low, is there certain things that you know always happen? Are there areas that have some indications? So why do, first of all, why do companies have cloud cost overruns? That's a great question. And let's start with a bit of history where we came from. So in a, in a pre-cloud world, you built your own data centers, which means that you had an upfront CapEx cost and you spent the money and you were forced to live within the means that your data center provided. You really couldn't spend any more. That provided kind of a predictable expenditure model. It came in big chunks, but uh, 
you know what your budget was going to be four years from now, three years from now, and you built for that. With the cloud computing, your consumption is now on an on-demand basis and it's API enabled. So the developer can just ask for more resources. So without any kind of tools that tell the developer, here is X amount of CPU or X amount of memory that you need for this particular service that uh, for it to deliver the right uh, performance that for the customer, the developer is incentivized to basically give it a lot more than the application needs. Why? Because the de developer doesn't want to pick up service tickets. He is incentivized in delivering functionality quickly and moving on to the next project, not in optimizing costs. So that creates sort of a, an agency problem that the guy that actually controls how resources are consumed is not incentivized to control uh, the consumption of these resources. And we see that across the board in every company. Engineers, in the engineering organization is a separate organization than the financial organization. So uh, the, the control place is different than the consumption place and it breaks down. The patterns are over provision. And what we wanna do is give engineers the tools to consume precisely the right amount of resources for the service level objectives that they have. Now, given that you want a transaction rate of X and a latency rate of Y, here's how you configure your cloud infrastructure so the application delivers according to those SLOs with the least possible resources consumed. So on this tool you guys have and the software you guys have, how, how do you guys go to market with that? You target the business buyer or the developer themselves and, and how do you handle the developer saying, I don't want anyone looking over my shoulder, I'm going I'm to have a blank check, I'm going to do whatever it takes. Um, how do you guys roll that out? Because I mean, obviously the business benefits are significant, controlling the budget, I get that. Um, how do you guys rolling this out? How do people engage with you? What's your strategy? Right, our, our buyer is the application owner, is the guy that owns the PNL for the application. It tends to be a VP level or a senior director person that owns a SaaS platform. And he or she is responsible for delivering good products to the market and de delivering good financial results to the CFO. So in that persona, everything is rolled up, but that persona will always favor the revenue side, which means consume more resources than you need in order to maximize customer happiness, therefore faster growth. And uh, they do that while sacrificing the cost side. So by giving the product owner the optimization tools, the autonomous of optimization tools that Opsani has, we allow him or her to deliver the right experience to the customer with the right with, uh, sufficient resources and uh, address both the performance and the cost side of the equation simultaneously. Awesome, can you talk about the impact um, CICD is having in the cloud native computing on the optimization cycle? Um, obviously, you know, shifting left for security, we hear a lot of that. You're hearing a lot of more microservices being spun up, spun down automatically. Uh, obviously Kubernetes clusters are going mainstream. You're starting to see a lot more dynamic <laughs> uh, activity if you, if you, in, in these new workflows. What is the impact of these new CICD cloud native uh, computing on the optimization cycle? Yeah, CICD is there to enable a fast delivery of software features, basically. Uh, so, you know, we have a combination of uh, Git, GitOps, where you can just pull down repositories, libraries, open source projects from left and right, and using glue code, developers can deliver functionality really quick. In fact, microservices are there in service of that capability. Deliver uh, functionality quickly by being able to build functional blocks and then through APIs you, you put everything together. So CICD is just accelerates the software delivery code. Uh, and between the time the boss says, give me an application until the, uh, the application team plus the DevOps team plus the SRE team puts it out in production, you know, now we can do this really quickly. The problem is though, nobody optimizes in the process. So when we deliver 1.0 in six months or less, we've done zero in terms of optimization. And that 1.0 becomes a way that we go through QA in many cases, unfortunately. And it also becomes a way that we go through the optimization. The customer screams, the UI is laggy, you know, the throughput is really slow. And we tinker and tinker and tinker, and by the time it typically goes through a 12-month uh, cycle of maturation, we, we get that system stability and the right performance. With AI and machine learning that Opsani has enabled, we can deliver that, we can shrink that time out considerably. In fact, 
you know, what we're going to announce in KubeCon is uh, something that we call KiteStorm, is the ability to uh, install our uh, product in a Kubernetes environment in, in roughly 20 minutes, and within two days, you get the results. So before, you had this optimization cycle that was going on for a very long time. Now that's it's shrunk down, and because of CI/CD, you know you don't have the luxury of waiting, and the system itself can become uh, part of the way of configuring the system. The system, being the uh, AI ML service that Upsani delivers, can be uh, part and parcel of the CI/CD pipeline that optimizes the code and gives you the right configuration in the get-go. So you guys are really getting down and injecting in some meta, uh, instrumentation for metadata around key areas. Is that right? Is that kind of how it's working? Are you getting in there with code to kind of watch? Um, how was it working under the hood? Can you just give me a quick example of you know, how this would play out and what people might expect, how it would handle? Of course. Uh, so what the way we optimize application performance is we have to have a metric against which we measure performance that metric is an slo service level objective and in a kubernetes environment we typically tap into prometheus which is the metrics uh, gathering place metrics database for kubernetes workloads and we really focus on red metrics uh, the rate of transactions the error rate and d for delay or latency so we focus on these three metrics and uh, what we have to do is inject a small container, it's an open source container, into the application workspace. Uh, we call that uh, container Servo. Servo interacts with Prometheus to get the metrics, and then it talks to our backend to tell the ML engine what's happening. And the ML engine and does this analysis and comes back with a new configuration, which then Servo implements in a canary instance. So the Canary instance is where we run our experiments and we compare it against the main line, which the application is doing. After uh, roughly 20 iterations or so, the ML engine learns what part of the problem space to focus on in order to optimize, to, to deliver the optimal results. And then it very quickly comes to the right set of solutions to try. And it, it tries those inside, a, uh, in, inside the Canary instance. And when it finds the optimal solution, it gives the recommendation back to the application team, or alternatively, when you have enough trust in Upsani, you can auto promote it into mainline. That's awesome. That's how gets the learning in there. This is a great example of some cloud native action. I want to get into some examples with your customers, but before we get there, I want to ask you, since I have you here, Amir, if you don't mind, what does cloud native mean these days? Because you know, cloud native has become kind of much, oh, cloud computing, um, which essentially go move to the cloud. But as people start developing in the cloud, where there's real new benefits, People talk about the word cloud native. Could you take a quick minute to define what is cloud native? What does that even mean? What does cloud native mean? Uh, I'll try to give you my understanding of it. And we could get into a bit of philosophy. Uh, <laughs> sure, yeah, it's good. Yeah, uh, but basically cloud native means it's uh, your application is built for the cloud and it takes advantages of the uh, inherent benefits that a cloud environment can give you, which means that you can grow and shrink resources on the fly, if you build your application correctly, that you can scale up and scale down your number of instances very quickly. And uh, everything is taken advantage of uh, APIs. So initially that was kind of done inside of VM environment. Uh, uh, AWS EC2 is a perfect example of that. Kubernetes made, uh, shifted cloud native to a containerized workload because it allows for rapid, or more rapid deployment and even a, enables or it takes advantage of a, of a more rapid development cycle. As we look forward, cloud native is more likely uh, to be a, a serverless environment where you write functions and the backend systems of the cloud service provider just give you that capability and you don't have to worry about man, man, maintaining and managing a uh, fleet of any sort, whether it's VMs or containers. That's where it's going to go. Currently, we are the containerized phase. So as you start getting into the serverless model, you got Lambda, which we've been playing with, loves it. As you get into that, that's going to accelerate more data. So I got to ask you, as you get into more of this, this mon I won't say monitoring or observability, however you want to look at it, you got to get at the data. This becomes a critical part of solving a lot of problems and also making sure that the machine learning is learning the right thing. How do you view that, you guys over there? Because I think everyone's like getting that cloud native, and they, it's not hard sell to say that's all good. Mm -hmm. But where it can go bad, 
It's, you know, you know the expression, ships created ships and then you have shipwrecks. You know, there's always a, a double-edged sword here. So what's the downside if you don't get the data right? Uh, well, so the, for us, the problem is not too much data, it's lack of data. So if you don't get data right, is you don't have enough data. And uh, the places where optimization uh, cannot be automated is where the transaction rates are slow, where you don't have enough throughput coming into the application. And it really becomes difficult to optimize that application with any kind of speed. Uh, you have to be able to profile the application long enough to know what moves its needle uh, and in order for you to hit the SLO targets. So it's not too much data. It's not enough data that seems to be the problem. And uh, there are a lot of applications that are expensive to run, but, uh, but have a low throughput. And I, I would, uh, in, in, in all cases, actually in every customer environment that I've been in where that's been the case, the application is just uh, over provisioned. If you have a low throughput environment and um, it, it's costing too much, don't use ML to solve it. That's a wrong application of the technology. Just take a sledgehammer and you know, back your resources by 50%, see what happens. And if that nothing breaks, then back it again until you find the breakage point. Yeah, exactly. You over you over and you bang it back down again. It's like, you know, the old school. Now with the cloud, take me through some examples where you guys had some success. Obviously you guys are in the right area right now. You're seeing a lot of people looking at this area to, to do that. And in some cases, sledgehammer their whole data center and refactor their business. But as you get it with customers with the app side, what are some successes? Can you share? Um, some of the use cases that you guys are being successful with your customers, can you give some examples? Yeah, so um, um, a well-known financial software for mid-sized businesses that, that does accounting. You know, it's, uh, uh, they're, they're our customer, they're in a large fleet, and this product has been around for a while. This is not a containerized product, this product runs on VMs, and Java is a large component of that. So uh, the problem for this particular vendor has been uh, that they run on a heterogeneous fleet. That the application has been a, a long, uh, a, a, around for a very long time, and as new instance types on AWS have come in, uh, developers have used those. So the fleet itself is quite heterogeneous, and uh, depending on the time of the day and what kind of reports are being run by, by organizations, they, the mix of resources that the applications need are different. So, uh, when we started analyzing the stack, we, start, we started looking at three different tiers. We, we looked at the database level, we looked at the Java mid-tier, and we looked at the web front end. And uh, one of the things that uh, became counterproductive is that ML discovered that using, for the mid-tier, using larger instances, but fewer of them, allowed for better performance and lower cost. And uh, you know, typically, yeah, your gut feel is to go with smaller instances and more of them, a larger fleet, if you would. But in this case, what the ML produced was completely counterintuitive. And the net result for the customer was a 78% cost reduction, while latency went down by 10%. So think about it, that your the response time is less, uh, you know, is 10% less, but your costs are down almost 80%, you know, 78% in this case. And the other artifact that happened in the Java mid-tier is that we improved garbage collection significantly. And because of gar whenever garbage collection happens on a, in a, a JVM, it takes a pause. And that, from a customer pers perspective, it reflects as downtime because the machines are not responding. So by tuning garbage collection on JVMs across this very large fleet, we were able to recover over 5,000 minutes a month across the entire fl uh, fleet. So uh, this, these are some substantial savings. And this is what uh, the right application of machine learning on a large fleet can do for a SaaS business. And so talk about this fleet dynamic. You mentioned serverless. How do you see the future evolving for you guys? Where are you um, skating to where the puck is as the expression goes? Um, obviously with serverless is going to have essentially unlimited fleets potentially. That's going to put a lot of power in the hands of developers. Okay, and right. people building experiences. What's the next five years look like uh, for you guys? So uh, looking at the product from a product perspective, uh, the serverless market depends on the mercy of the cloud service provider. And typically the algorithms that they use, uh, it, uh, basically they keep very few instances warm for you until your, the rate of API calls goes up and they start, uh, they start, uh, uh, start turning on VMs or containers for you. And then the, the system becomes more responsive over time. 
One place that we can optimize the serverless environment is give predictability of what the cyclicality of load is. So we can pre-provision those instances and warm up the engine before the loads come in so the system always uh, stays responsive. Now, you may have noticed that some of your apps on your phone that when you start them up, they may have a startup like a minute or two, especially if it's a esoteric app. What's happening in those cases is you're starting an API calls goes in, a container is being started up for you to serve up that instance. Not enough of them are warm to give you that rapid response. And that, that can lead to customer churn. So by, by analyzing what the load on the overall load of the system is and pre-provisioning the system, we can prevent the downtime uh, at, uh, or prevent the, the lag, the startup lag. On the downside, which when you know when the usage goes down, it doesn't make sense to keep that many instances up. So we can talk to the backend infrastructure and decommission those VMs in order to, make, uh, to prevent cost creeps, basically. So that's one place that uh, we're thinking about extending our technology. So it's like, it's like the classic uh, example where people say, oh, during Black Monday, everyone surges to do e-commerce. You guys are thinking about it on a level that's a user-centric kind of use case where you look at the application and be smart about what the expectation is on any given situation and then flex the resources on that. Is that right? Is that, am I getting right? So if it's an, your example, the app is a good one. If I want to load fast, that's the expectation. It better load fast. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> it. But you know, I'm more of a romantic, so I use Valentine's Day and flowers yeah. in, my, in my example. <laughs> but, but you know, it doesn't have to be annual cycles. It, it, it can be daily cycles or hourly cycles. And all those patterns are, are learnable by, by an ML backend. All right, so I mean, I got to ask you, I love the, uh, this, this, this new concept because most people think auto scaling, right? Because that's a server concept, right? I can auto scale or database. You know, okay, I'm going to scale up. You're getting down to the point where, okay, we'll keep the engines warm, getting more detailed. How do you explain this versus say a concept like auto scaling? Is it the same? Are they cousins? They're, they're basically, the way they're expressed, it's the same technology, but their, their way they're expressed is different. So, uh, in a Kubernetes environment, uh, the HPA is your autoscaler. It basically, in, con uh, in response to the need, it spawns more instances and you get more containers going on. What happens in a serverless environment is you're unaware of the underpinnings that do that scale up for you. But there is an autoscaler in place that does that scale up for you. So the question becomes that where, where in the init stack from a customer's perspective are you talking about? If you're managing your instances, we're, we're dealing with the HPA. If you're managing uh, at, the, at the function level, we have to have API calls on the uh, service pro provider's infrastructure to, to pre-warm up the engine before the load comes. Yeah, I love it. I love this under the hood. It's kind of love new dynamics, kind of the same wine, new bottle, but still computer science, still coding, still cool and relevant to make these experiences great. Anyway, thanks for coming on this CUBE conversation. I really appreciate it. Take a minute to uh, put a plug in for the company. What are you guys doing in terms of status, funding, scale, employees? What are you looking for? And if someone's watching this and they should be a customer of you guys, what, what's, what's, what's going on in their world? What tells them that they need to be calling you? Yeah, so we're a series A. We've had uh, the privilege of, uh, our, yeah, we've been uh, privileged by having very good success with large enterprises. Uh, if you go on our website, you'll see the logos uh, of who we have. We will be at KubeCon, and there uh, we're going to be actively targeting the mid-market uh, or smaller Kubernetes instances. As I mentioned, it's going to take about 20 minutes to get started, and, and we'll show results in, in two hours. And our goal is for our customers to deliver the best user experience in terms of performance, reliability, uh, so that they, li they delight their customers in return and they do so without breaking the bank. So deliver excellent products, do it at the most efficient way possible, deliver good financial results for your stakeholders. This is what we do. So we encourage anybody who is running a SaaS company to come and take a look at us because we think we can help them and we can accelerate their, their growth at a lower cost. And the last thing people need is have someone coming breathing down their neck saying, hey, we're getting overcharged. Why are you guys screwing up? When they're not, they're trying to make a great experience. And I think this is kind of where people really want to do and push the envelope and not have to go back and revisit the cost overrun, sure. which if you, it's a good, it's actually a good sign if you get some cost overruns here and there, but because you're experimenting. But again, you don't want it to get out of control. 
You don't want to be habitual like a U.S. debt. <laughs> exactly. Amir, thank you for coming on. Great. We'll see you at KubeCon. The Cube will be there in person. It's a hybrid event, so uh, KubeCon's going to be awesome. And thanks for coming on The Cube. Appreciate it. John, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Okay. I'm John Furrier with The Cube here in Palo Alto, California. Remote interview uh, with Upsetti, Hot Startup Series A. I'm sure they're going to do well in the right spot in the market. Uh, really well poised in the cloud native. Thanks for watching.